Oregonians in two different cities, both victims of racist hate. He rolled his window down and he, he started calling us names. I was afraid that, uh, that we might get killed. Their experiences were similar, but they couldn't have been handled more differently. But we can't arrest people if we don't have a crime that we can prove. Tonight, KGW's Lindsay Nadrich reports why victims and advocates say Oregon needs to do a better job of addressing hate crimes. And a warning, some parts of the story may not be suitable for everyone. He just yelled and screamed and said all kinds of names that I don't want to say it, you know. He said, if I cut your head off right here, right now, nobody's going to even do anything about it because I'm white and you're, you're not. Two different people in two different cities both told me stories of how they were victims of hate. But their stories aren't isolated incidents. They say it happens all, all the time. time. Suad Elmi lives in Portland. She's a mom and works at a local nonprofit that helps refugees. A little more than a year ago, she says she was stopped in traffic with her son at 82nd and Powell when a man came up to her car and started banging on her window. Oh my, I was so shocked. Like, I was afraid that, uh, that we might get killed, you know. And my son was traumatized. He was scared. He was crying. Suad says the man used racist insults. He targeted me because I was, um, you know, a Muslim person wearing a scarf. I don't know why, why else, you know. Sergio Reyes Martinez lives and works in Eugene. He says he and his co-workers were threatened and assaulted by a man in a parking lot where they were working. He rolled his window down and he, he started calling those names, you know, like uh, racial names. Yeah. Yeah, he was calling, me, he was calling my co-worker Beaner, uh, wet bags. Uh, he called my co-worker um, uh, Gracie-ass Mexican. He was telling me that, that he got rights because he said, he said, you're going to jail. He said, you go to Mexico today, tonight. That's what he said. He said, my president is going gonna, is gonna to send you back. In both incidents, Sergio and Suad called police, but they have very different feelings about how their cases were handled. And that difference might just be because one case happened in Eugene and one happened in Portland. Two of Oregon's largest cities handle hate crimes in different ways, and that affects how police approach the case and what support victims get. There were key differences in the two cases. In Sergio's case, for example, the suspect both made verbal threats and physically assaulted one of his co-workers. But here's another difference. In Eugene, the police department isn't the only agency assigned to help victims of hate crimes and track how often they happen. The city also has what's called the Office of Human Rights and Neighborhood Involvement. That's where Fabio Andrade works. Many people call our office and they start by saying, I'm not sure if I'm calling the right place. Fabio's office tracks hate crimes and offers support to all victims, even if what happened to them doesn't result in criminal charges through the police department. Tracking the criminal and non-criminal incidents helps the city get a better idea of what's really going on so they can identify trends. If you don't know the problem, you cannot find the right solution. Eugene's tracking system also explains why it looks like the city has more hate crimes than any other in Oregon. Check out these FBI statistics on hate crimes from 2017, which is the latest year available. The report shows Portland only had 18 hate crime incidents, while Eugene had 72. Eugene's number is also more than all other cities combined. It's impossible that Eugene would be responsible for half of the hate crimes in Oregon, so we know that's not the case. It's a different story in Portland. The police bureau has two biased crime detectives who also work on assault cases. But there isn't an office like Fabio's that works alongside police. When it comes to tracking hate crimes, Lieutenant Tina Jones says the bureau follows federal guidelines. Not every crime that's reported to us as what someone perceives to be a biased crime ends up being a biased crime. She said even though someone may feel like they were the victim of a hate crime, it has to meet certain criteria to be investigated and tracked as one. That doesn't mean that that incident wasn't frightening for the person involved or that um, their perception, you know, is that they were maybe targeted because they fit into a protected class. But we can't arrest people if we don't have a crime that we can prove. That's frustrating for Suad. She was terrified by what happened to her and felt it was racially motivated. But police said they couldn't do anything about it and she had nowhere else to turn. If her incident had happened in Eugene, 
Suad would have at the very least been connected with Fabio's office like Sergio was. They supported him through the entire process, and the man who targeted him was charged with a hate crime and taken to court. It's just really hard, you know, to think about it again, you know, because it's been over a year, you know, since that happened, and it's just, it's just horrible going back, you know, and thinking about it. Even though the suspect was put on trial, the outcome of the case wasn't what Sergio was expecting. The man was found not guilty. I can't explain, you know, the feeling. It's, it makes you mad, you know, it makes you angry, you know, and it makes you, makes you sad, you know, and brings you back memories again, you know. Yeah. And the saddest thing is that nothing happened. You know, we went to court and, and they found him not guilty, you know. Yeah. <laughs> That sadness and anger is why victims and advocates say Oregon needs to do a better job of addressing hate crimes, because right now it's not consistent. That's about to change, though. On July 15th, the governor signed a new hate crimes bill into law. It establishes a hate crimes hotline for victims to call and directs agencies to do a better job of collecting and reporting data on hate crimes and bias incidents. I think this bill will uh, help Eugene not feel like the lonely uh, jurisdiction doing this kind of work. Many also hope it will help victims like Sergio and Suad not feel alone either. I try not to pay attention, but if, but if I was paying attention, I could say every day, it happens every day. It's really bad. I don't know if people understand that, but it's really hard. That was an eye-opening report. That was Lindsay Nadrich reporting. We do have an update on our breaking news. We told you at the top of the show in rural Washington County near Gaston where two deputies were shot. Let's go back to Kyle Boshi, who's in the newsroom. Kyle, we understand that a suspect is in custody? Right, a late development from the Washington County Sheriff's Office through a tweet confirming that indeed a suspect is now in custody. There is no longer a threat in the area. But again, the headline here is that we understand that two deputies were shot in this situation near Gaston. We don't know their conditions at this time, although we do know that Life Flight was called to the scene to assist. This all started about 4 o'clock today in the Gaston area. Homeowner reported that an unknown man may have stolen firearms from outside his home and then walked into the woods. Again, two deputies were shot. We don't know their condition at this time, but we can tell you the late development, the suspect is now in custody. Back to you. Thank you, Kyle. Well, it seems like everybody has a podcast these days, even the Portland Police Bureau. And today, Chief Danielle Outlaw was on Talking Beat to respond to critics ahead of another possible brawl in downtown Portland. This is video of a brawl between right-wing groups and anti-fascist counter-protesters. The Bureau has been criticized by some who say officers only protect one side of the brawls. Outlaw says that's just not true. I say time and time again, we focus on behaviors and not sides. As police, we are to be neutral. We plan. There's a lot of planning that goes into these events. If we even have the luxury of knowing about these events, of course, we don't want injuries. We want people to be able to come out and exercise their rights to uh, free speech without injury. All of that to say, we're not here to choose sides. After August 4th of last year, I received a lot of criticism. Um, I was called a race traitor and I was yelled at and asked, you know, what are little black girls going to think? about what you did today, and it was because we used force against those who uh, said they were counter demonstrating against another group. And I told them, you know, we focus on behaviors. She also said it's tough to prevent these violent protests because there's no way to physically stop people from traveling here. Now she's urging people not to show up when they hear about plan rallies that may get out of hand. A new international study suggests climate change is threatening the food supply of the entire planet. Well, more than 100 scientists contributed to the UN report. It warns climate change is dramatically degrading our land and how people use it. As a result, food is getting scarcer, more expensive, and less nutritious. The report says there are still things we can do to prevent things from getting worse. Things like changing the way we eat, grow food, and manage forests. Specifically, eating less meat and reducing food waste. 
From global climate to our local weather now, Chief Meteorologist Matt Zafino is here. Matt, you're tracking some pretty big storms out there. It's been an active afternoon. Lots of thunderstorms, some of which have become severe, especially in central Oregon, a new cluster there. We've had two severe thunderstorms, one right over Bend, another one a little bit farther to the north and east. Right now, these storms are not technically severe, but still producing a lot of lightning, potentially some hail, gusty winds and the like. And this isn't the only area either. Look at this. Great picture for you. I've got a lot of them to share with you. This from north of Hood River, there's Mount Adams, and you can see these big thunderheads up to the northeast of Mount Adams. Some of those became severe as well. So more on these storms in a bit. Back to you.